I was uh, in the land of Pakistan some years ago, and a man in the majority culture came to me, put out his hand, crushed my fist, and he said, Greetings in the name of the Most High One. Now, when you're in Pakistan, you do not know who is the Most High One. <laughs> and he finished out and he said, The Lord Jesus Christ. So, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, here, greetings in the name of the Most High One, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a great joy. It's only one worth applauding. <laughs> a great joy to be here uh, back in your wonderful uh, city where a, a five-minute walk is a 15-minute drive. <laughs> uh, to be here uh, in your country of uh, the Philippines, the whole world has been watching you not only for the floods that have overtaken uh, the city and this region, but also because the performance of the stock market, one of the best in the world, uh, also to be in your church. Uh, Pastor Luis and I were friends uh, three decades ago. We were uh, at Dallas Seminary together, and he had me speak here about 15 years as I, uh, ago, I remember. So if the averages keep up, I should be back here in 2027, uh, uh, the Lord willing. Uh, we lost him uh, uh, all of a sudden, and uh, this temporary connection will be restored uh, someday when we have an eternal conversation with him and his uh, father, our Lord Jesus, as well. But um, the relationship with GCF does go back quite a, a ways. Uh, the, about 15 years ago, we actually recorded an entire preaching series on how to preach, and uh, that's called the Scripture Sculpture Method. It's distributed all over the world, taught to thousands of pastors worldwide, and uh, every time the video plays, we have GCF at the back. So I got you some free publicity, and I've come here to collect my dues. <laughs> I also know other pastors that uh, you have, Dr. Uh, Nari Santos, uh, Pastor Lito, Pastor Nixon, and, and others. The, the reason I'm here this weekend is to visit with the leaders of your country, especially those of the faith, in terms of a, a very large project that we're looking at. It's called the Global Proclamation Commission, an attempt to connect, unite, strengthen pastors all over the world into a global proclamation community. For about 200 years, uh, the Christian faith has flourished and we are seeing the massive impact and fruit of 200 years of Western missions all over the world. But now there's a huge new phenomenon of over 2.2 million pastors in the world who are located all over on site, being far more relevant to their churches. The only problem is only 5% of these 2.2 million pastors are formally trained. That means they'll be preaching right now at this very moment. Some have already finished preaching because of time zones and yet to preach today. Uh, who will simply be getting up under-trained and isolated. The Global Proclamation Commission attempts to connect, unite, strengthen pastors across the world. In the many tactical streams of connecting, uniting, strengthening them, we have a major mid-decade event that the Lord willing will happen in your fine city. It's called the Global Proclamation Congress. PCEC has uh, invited REACH to join together for this particular event. And your own pastor, Mark Sospenia, is the Philippines uh, coordinator and director of this uh, Congress. We are attempting to bring up to 5,000 pastoral trainers, not pastors, but pastoral trainers who are ministering in about 200 countries, we're asking them to commit to 25 pastors every year for the following five years so we can have the next level and the wave of pastors trained. Uh, we chose Manila over five other cities, Dubai, Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, Thailand, uh, for, for one reason. Uh, first of all, uh, Manila is... Uh, far more humorous than the rest of the world. 
Uh, we have better jokes and humor in Manila than any other part of the world. Uh, but uh, other reasons are like Christian infrastructure. Uh, you are the future of the Christian faith. And the way God has moved in your land is a powerful testimony to it. Uh, visa openness to the rest of the world. Uh, hospitality culture, uh, which uh, caters to, to uh, what the needs of the world might be. Uh, everything else too, airline connections and, and so on. English use, rather than Thailand, where there's very little English, and hopefully much less expensive. But the humor is going to really be the one which makes the mark on pastoral trainers. So, would you pray for this very large project? It's complicated, it's integrated, uh, that God will allow it to happen. And I want GCF to be a large part of this particular uh, uh, global decade-long project which focuses in the mid-decade giant push of the flywheel. We want the momentum that that will bring. So, uh, both today and tomorrow in your great land, I'm trusting that what is vision becoming reality will continue to have a great impact. At the end of it, the anticipated outcome is to deliver spiritual health for 1,000 million individuals. Bill Gates is focused on HIV AIDS, uh, Prime Minister Tony Blair on malaria eradication. Uh, our own focus is on spiritual health, which is deeper and longer. Actually, one of GCF's great uh, couples uh, did the final uh, decision for me. They said, bring Manila, we can get this done. So, honored to be here. I am under severe jet lag right now. I arrived early this morning. When they asked me if I wanted to take a nap, I said, no, I'd, I'd rather just nap while I'm speaking. <laughs> I, I once had a dream that I was speaking. When I woke up, I was. Uh, and so, as long as uh, you're able to f follow me today, I'm trusting that my tiredness will be wonderfully made up by the sufficiency and the adequacy of the Holy Spirit. All right, if you have a Bible accessible, we are in a series called Living as God Intended. It's a consideration of the Sermon on the Mount. The passage that's been assigned to me is Matthew chapter 6 verses 1 to 4. So if you can turn off your cell phones, but you can turn in your cell phones to Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 to 4 will be the focus. And as we go into this talk, I'd like to dedicate it to the author. I want you to pray with me a very short six, seven word prayer which simply goes, Lord Jesus, open my heart to you this morning. So would you bow, please, and would you pray that prayer aloud with me? Lord Jesus, open my heart to you this morning. You have ways of uh, taking our prayers and turning them into very specific, strategic uh, moments and decisions. And so I rely on you again, O oh Holy Spirit, who has preceded my coming into the lives of every person sitting here. You've been working through the day, uh, through yesterday, through the months, and you'll be in their lives way after I'm gone. And so for these uh, some moments together, would you uh, dominate this entire environment? Please overcome my limitations. Make up for my inadequacies. And remove any wrong motives from me. And uh, make me adequate for this task. To the glory of the Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I ask these things. Amen. You know that uh, many of the museums in Italy are all uh, Christian-themed, especially those who uh, 
were built during the Renaissance. There's one particular painting which intrigues the observer where a monk seems to be praying with an open Bible and folded hands. It's a rather impressive painting of external holiness. But as you step closer, you look at this painting and you find that the open Bible is really a fruit bowl. He's actually squeezing an orange. And he's got his eyes closed so that the juice will not get into his eyes. I don't know what people will conclude by looking at you from far off and then examining your heart and your motives if they came close by. I would like to speak this morning on PR spirituality, public relations spirituality. Now, all of us know public relations. It's a necessary and a neutral function that is really a management function where an organization or a business, even there's personal branding so that there will be a certain point of view uh, that is uh, disseminated to the public. But we also know that there's public relations which is not so uh, innocent. And many of you who are here in sales and marketing and PR, uh, you know we can do negative stuff too. Uh, there is actually a negative view of public relations because it seems like sometimes we use the platforms and the technology that are given to us to spin untruths, to deceive people, to manipulate people in underhanded ways in order to get them to think better of us. That we want to appear differently than at first glance. A second glance makes it very complex. Daniel Burston, who defines celebrity as a man well-known for his well-knownness, also said this. Some people are born great. Other people achieve greatness. The rest of us hire public relations officers <laughs> to make us look great and better than we really are. We can spin it. We can appear we can pose, we can psychologically manipulate, we can create an impression called impression management and reputation management, where it's based on image rather than character, and especially those of us from Asian backgrounds and Filipino and Chinese backgrounds, even in our apparent humility, are really secretly prideful. I'm told that when Moses had the, the children of Israel standing at the Red Sea, could not get them across, he called a general of the Israeli army and said, what can we do? He said, it's too late. If we had more time, we would have built bridges. He called the admiral of the Israeli navy and said, uh, what could we do? Cross the Red Sea. And he said, well, if we had time, we would have built barges. General built bridges. Admiral navy built barges. And then he called a PR, oh, public relations officer, and said, what can we do? And he said, I don't know what we can do, but if we get the people across, I'll get you two to three pages of text in the Old Testament. I want to ask questions of your heart. I want to probe your motives this morning. And because the stroke of brilliance... The Lord Jesus is addressing what we call external righteousness, external behavior, external spirituality, public relations spirituality, that does not match our heart. Often there's complaint against the Christian church because we're all hypocrites, you know that, right? Meaning, we say something in public and we don't meet our own preachings. But this particular external righteousness does not have to do with not having met our standards. We are meeting our standards and exceeding them for the sake of public relations. We're doing even better. 
than our preachings. So Matthew chapter 6 follows Matthew 5. The last part of Matthew 5 has six particular matters about inner spirituality. Things like divorce and oath and lust and, and murder. But now comes Matthew 6, not addressing inner spirituality, but outer spirituality. Remember, you've got to take Matthew 5 to 7 as one sermon. It was one long sermon. It's the greatest sermon ever preached, best known across the world. Mahatma Gandhi used to call it the great sermon on the mount. Because he was taken up with the behavioral holiness that Jesus was expecting of his people. A standard that could not be met. Now in verse 1, the Lord Jesus gives a principle. This is on public relations spirituality. Look at verse 1 with me. He says, beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with the Father who is in heaven. Now, that's the principle. And then from verse 2 on, he has three particular ways in which people try to practice righteousness. He first talks about giving, and that is our focus today. And then he talks about praying. This is the Lord's Prayer that many of us rehearse and repeat. And then there is fasting. And all of those three applications come from verse 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before human beings, to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Now, anybody who's in sales, marketing, PR, you know that every product and service has what we call features, advantages, and benefits. And that's how I'm going to process features, advantages, and benefits. Features is what the thing is. Advantages, what does it do? Unique differentiation. And benefits, what does it mean? First, public relations spirituality. Where the Lord Jesus is saying, don't be engaged in a way that tries to impress people. At the feature level, we're all doing the same thing. Practicing righteousness. Look at verse 1. Your righteous acts. These are acts of righteousness. These are not acts of unrighteousness. Good works are good in themselves. Good works do not become bad except if your motives corrupt them. But by themselves, in themselves, they're good. It's only the motive and the function that you attribute to them which make them wrong. This is an entire lifestyle that these Pharisees and hypocrites used to practice. A little later on in that particular passage, he calls them hypocrites. Many of you know that the word hypocrites comes from an actor, a person who wears a mask, who wants to appear differently than who he really is. It's a character that he assumes. They're actors rather than agents. Somebody defined a hypocrite as a mortician who's trying to look sad at a $10,000 funeral. It was Abraham Lincoln who said, a hypocrite is one who murders his parents and he appeals to the judge for mercy because he is now an orphan. The mask that we wear, that people look at us and form impressions about us that we control so they can have a positive view of who we are when our hearts are corrupt. If you only know me, you won't listen to me. And of course, if I knew you, I wouldn't talk to you either. <laughs> so let's leave that stuff out and come back to the text, okay? <laughs> because we all have a need, almost a psychological need, to appear differently and appear better. In fact, I believe in your badness much more than I believe in my badness, which is proof of my badness. They were practicing righteousness to be noticed by men. That's the advantage. The advantage here was practicing righteousness to be noticed 
by men. It was in good public view. Everybody looked at them and said, wow, this guy is the paragon of spirituality. The Pharisees, which uh, Jesus actually uh, took to task, whom they, uh, he took to task in, in strong ways, uh, they were actually good people. In fact, they could have come to GCF without a problem. They could have sung the songs. They knew the word of God. They listened to fine preaching every week. Uh, they voted for the right people. They had the right morality about them. Looking at them, you would want to associate with them while you played a golf game. While you went to the club, you would have wanted to be with them. The Talmud actually lists about seven kinds of Pharisees. Here are a couple. The first one is called the shouldering Pharisee. The shouldering Pharisee is one who wanted to shoulder the burden of good reputation. He paraded his good deeds. Another kind of Pharisee is called the delaying Pharisee, who would delay his business in order to get good deeds done. Not many people would do that, will they? Another one was called the pestle Pharisee. He always looked down so that he would be externally humble. Another one is called the bruised Pharisee. Listen to this. The bruised Pharisee did not want to look at a woman with lust. So he would inadvertently bump his head against the wall. And he'd be bruised and bleeding all over. And when they asked him, hey, how come your face is all bruised? He'll say, uh, I'm trying not to look at a woman with lust. It was an accident. And the Pharisees could have been found in evangelical churches all over the world. If they were living today, they would have hired a third party to do a search online, Google their names to find out how their online identity could be changed, could be bettered. They would have hired third party monitors uh, in order to be their PR officers to change their reputation. They're just like us. What is the advantage? They got noticed by men. It also says at the end of verse 2 that they'll be honored by men. That's a huge advantage, really. Because sometimes for the sake of uh, the recognition of others, you do things. It feeds your ego. It allows you to perform well. Because motives are that which control you. A people does not do what they say they believe. People do what they value. And Jesus is addressing the issue of value. If you want to value, honor, and recognition, by humans, that's an advantage, definitely, you will have favor with them. That's a motive. See, a motive gives you direction, whether it's good motive or bad motive. A motive gives you energy, whether it's good motive or bad motive. A motive gives you freedom to pursue it, tremendous autonomy. You can never not have motive. The question is whether it's a good motive or bad motive. The advantage in public relations spirituality was human recognition. I know Philippines, you follow NBA basketball a lot. One of my friends, is one of the, uh, I think he's the winningest coach in NBA basketball. He's 75 now. The New Jersey Nets, have you ever heard of that group? They're a losing team, okay? And a Russian billionaire bought that team. And he asked my friend to come and be the coach. And he said, Nyet, Nyet, New York, uh, New Jersey, Nyet. Meaning, no, no, I won't do it. Because they were so badly off, nobody came to the games. And so they had to use crowd noise, taped, recorded, and used 
during the game in order to give the players additional energy and focus and direction. And they will blow up dolls and keep them on the chair so the players will think there's a lot of people there. Sometimes you perform just for human recognition. That's an advantage. But here's the benefit. The benefit, unfortunately, was defective. The benefit of doing good things was defective. Look at verse 2. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you. These Pharisees actually sounded the trumpet. Many of the streets in Israel are very small. Everybody knows in a village what everybody else is doing, okay? The social uh, gossip mill is easy. You're watching everybody, is it? But the Pharisees decided that they needed to announce their giving. So what did they do? They had a trumpet fanfare. They paid a trumpet player to come and blow the trumpet when they went to give money in the synagogue and on the streets. Truly I say to you, here's the benefit. Unfortunately defected, they have their reward in full. If you're doing things for human recognition, you already have your reward. Full reward, right now. The problem with human recognition is that it's superficial, it's Timely in the sense of short, and it turns sour very fast. And that's why an election which is so focused on one person winning can change the next day and somebody else is voted in. That's why you don't remember who won the Nobel Prizes last year. You don't even remember many of the Olympic gold and silver and bronze medalists of this year. If I were to ask you who won the Oscar Awards of a couple of years ago, you don't remember. That's human recognition. You already have your reward full, finished. So you get to choose whether you'll have a PR, public relations spirituality, which says, I want that kind of recognition. Recently, there was an article, August 26th, in the Financial Times, about a Robert Wilson in terms of philanthropy and architecture. He's a retired New York fund, hedge fund manager who gave away $500 million. And they asked him, why don't people give more? And he said, simply because they do not want to fall off from the Forbes 400 list. That there is a peer pressure not to give. In that way, they get human So you give for human recognition and you don't give for human recognition. You can have your reward right now. But Robert Wilson himself, he decided to do some due diligence on people and they found, he found out that everybody dies. And after his huge due diligence, he said, if everybody's going to die, I might as well give it away when I'm still alive. You have your reward in full. PR spirituality, you want to publicize, you want to manage impression, you want to manage your image as to what people think about you, you've got your reward in full. The Pharisees had two challenges. One is called formalism or externalism, where they wanted to control people's impression about them. The other is called legalism, where they wanted to control people's behavior around them. The only thing Jesus our Lord is speaking about here is the formalism. Other times he's talking about legalisms, okay? This time is simply your public righteousness for public relations. For human recognition, you already got your reward. The story is told of a church in the remote part of uh, the Philippines, which was in a rather dilapidated state. The congregation got together to see if the church building should be repaired or replaced. At the congregational meeting, everybody knew that the church building had to be replaced. Unfortunately, the entire decision hinged on one wealthy deacon. He waited and waited, and the people waited and waited. And finally, after everybody had expressed their opinion, he got up 
And he said, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, we know that all of you want this church building to be replaced. But I think it's better use of funds simply to repair this church building, and I would like to give 10,000 pesos toward it. And everybody was disappointed. Being a rather substantive man, as he was making his way down, apparently he shook the building and a roof tile got loose and came and hit him on his head. He quickly turned around, came back to the pulpit and said, uh, I didn't know that this building was in such bad shape. Uh, I would like to anonymously <laughs> increase my donation to repair rather than replace the church building and I'd like to give a hundred thousand pesos and as he was making his way down an older lady at the back saying Lord please hit Mr. Anonymous again and again and again <laughs> ten more times public relations spirituality it's for human recognition the benefit is defective you already have it But now we're going to move into another PR spirituality. We're going to call this personal relationship spirituality. Personal relationship holiness. Verse 3, but, important word but, you do not want to be engaged in public relations spirituality, but, here are the features, when you give to the poor, the same like the previous group. Good works, almsgiving is good. Praying is good, fasting is good. When you give, not if you give, when it's assumed. All charity uh, has this particular premise. Meaningful charity does not bring attention to the donor. Dignified charity does not bring attention to the beneficiary. He says, I want it to be meaningful. But when you give to the poor, who is the you? He's distinguishing the you from the hypocrites. In fact, he intensifies says, you and your father. Your father who sees in secret will reward you. The hypocrites thought they themselves were their father. No, but the... Lord Jesus is speaking about you and your father. Meaning this relationship come this giving comes from a relationship with your father. The doctrine of the fatherhood of God in the Bible is very clear. God is not the father of everybody. He is the creator of everybody. He is the maker of everybody. He is the sustainer of everybody. But the hypocrites did not have God as a father, so God is not their father. It's you and your father. A relationship of a son to a father rather than a servant to a master. A servant to a master has a wage. The wage is contracted. A reward is never contracted. If they wanted an accounting audit metaphor like the tax revenue system of a country, uh, they could calculate how much People owed them. God says, no, that's not how I want you to relate to me. I want you to relate to me as family. The fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of men, very important doctrines, but there are limited doctrines. In the Old Testament, only three times God is called Father, but never individually. Father of the nation, Father of the nation. So a couple of verses later, when the Lord Jesus is teaching them to do the, what's called the disciples' prayer, not the Lord's prayer, our Father, which art, who art in heaven, the, it offended Jewish sensibilities. They couldn't believe that you could call God Father. In fact, there's another monotheism in the world today, which has 99 names for God. One name is missing, calling God Father. Jesus says, I've come to reveal the Father to you. If you want to call God the Father, your Father, no one comes to the Father, the Lord Jesus says, what? Except through me. 
So if you're not sure about who your father in God is, the Lord Jesus is the means to that father. And then there's the brotherhood of man. I know that's very fav- favorite as a slogan across the world. We believe in the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. Uh, the only brothers are those who belong to the same father. The world is a neighborhood. The world is not a brotherhood. We've got to love our neighbor. But you have a relationship to your brother. Because you both share the same father. Even though some of your brothers act like hoods rather than brothers, they are your brothers. Are you following me? Where I grew up, in India we say yes, like this, and no, like this, okay? Yeah. Yes. Some people say yes and no, like this, and confuse everybody. So. <laughs> now this feature is good works. Good works are not bad. Please continue in your good works, in your giving, in your praying, in your fasting. Good works are not bad. They will be turned into badness when you do them for the notice of men. Faith alone saves, said the Reformation, but the faith that saves is never alone. It follows from good works. Now, listen, it comes from inside your heart, follows into good works, comes from inside your heart. Works. Your good works do not create salvation. If you think by giving X number of pesos to God, you will create your salvation, you're faulty. The Old Testament had that theology interpreted by some, that if they did enough praying, enough fasting, enough giving, God will grant them salvation. There's another monotheistic religion which goes this way. Prayer will give you halfway to heaven, Fasting will bring you to the door of heaven. Almsgiving will give you full admission. The problem with that is you're never sure you'll gain full admission. Because God could have said, uh, one peso more, one peso more. Are you following me? So good works do not create salvation. Good works do not empower salvation. Good works, if you want to write this down, is an overflow of salvation. Because you have an inner, personal relationship, spirituality. Because he is your father, you overflow in good works. And that's why the Apostle Paul later on says, do good to all people. Do good. Especially to the household of faith. A little later on, Titus 3, about verse 8, he says, I want you to give deliberate attention, being busy about good works. If you believe in God, be busy about good works. The Lord Jesus in Matthew 5, at the end of the, uh, the Beatitudes, said this, Let your light so shine before men, so that they may see your what? Good works and glorify you. Glorify your Father. So good works is not the problem. But let's look at the advantage of a personal relationship spirituality. You have the right motive. You're not attempting to make an impression on them. He says, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Have you ever tried to keep your left hand from knowing what your right hand is doing? Usually my left hand and right hand both doing the same thing. One man says, it really means your wife should not know what the husband is doing. (laughs) Now the left hand and the right hand cannot conflict. So he's not talking about competition between left hand and right hand. Secondly, he's not talking about the ignorance of the left hand of what the right hand is doing because the hand does not know anything. It's the mind and the heart that know things in the Bible. The hand does not know anything. 
is a proverb. It's a saying. It goes like this. Conceal what you're giving. You don't have to publicize it. That's the context. Because concealment keeps you from vanity and pride. Concealing what you're giving keeps you from judging others who are giving less. And concealing what you're giving keeps you from greed. So, psychologically it's a good thing, but in terms of economics it's a good thing as well. To your left hand not know what your right hand is doing. Listen to me very, very carefully. If people notice what you give, guess what happens? They start positioning themselves to notice you even more so they can qualify to get whatever you're going to give. And then there's competition between those in need because how much they notice you is how much you're going to give. And so sometimes they do foolish things in order to get your attention. They even do wrong things in order to get your attention. They want to make themselves deserving for you to give because you like to be noticed by them. And while they stroke your ego, you are meeting their needs. Just in pure economics, it's good sense. Do not let your left hand what your right hand is doing, just conceal it. Now there are times when your giving becomes public, but your intention was not public. There are times when a, a person is being honored with, with a building or something, but your intention was not public. There are times when incentives have to be changed, but your intention was not to make it public. Giving is good. And giving in secret is even better. The Bible has an entire theology of giving. For example, it says give voluntarily. I'm drawing these from 1 Corinthians 16, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, so on. Give voluntarily. You're never obligated to give. Because when you're obligated to give, you start giving in order to obligate God to you. You give voluntarily. This is not a call to not give. It is a call to secret giving. This is not a call to hold on and hoard. This is a call to anonymous giving, if at all possible. I've just been in Psalm 50, and 49, and so on. It's my reading cycle right now. And God makes a huge case against hypocrites. He also wants to say, I am the needless one. I do not need anything. I own the cattle on the thousand hills and all that particular set of verses. If you think I'm needy, that's the biggest mistake you'll make. The only reason I've chosen to receive from you is because you need to be needed. Give voluntarily, give joyfully, cheerfully. Give proportionately. Just because God has increased your income or decreased your income does not have to have an effect on increasing your lifestyle, probably why it should decrease your lifestyle. There are some who think that because God has increased my lifestyle and uh, giving, my money, my economics, my wage, and my status, I need to increase my lifestyle. Voluntarily, joyfully, proportionately, sacrificially. Paul speaks about the Macedonians who gave out of their poverty. The Lord Jesus speaks about the widow, not impressed by how much the Pharisees gave, but how much was really left after they finished giving. Uh, give. Giving is good. In fact, giving is the drain plug for greed. As my mentor used to say. I wrote an article after Bernie Madoff made off with a lot of money. 
about $65,000 million. Many Jewish charities were hurt by his Ponzi scheme. It's called Greed is Never Enough. Um, I can get that article to you if, if you want. Because money can shackle you. Now somebody recently said, give it a good kick by giving it. Money is neutral. But money worships and seeks to be worshipped. Money calls you to be loved in competition with God. And the only way to handle it is giving. My mentor's mentor, his company uh, on the stock exchange went to $156 per share. Very generous man. Once the son took over the father's company, however, the company began to die. Came down to about $2.75 a share. So my mentor asked his mentor, do you think if you had kept back some of your giving, you would have done better than losing it all? And the man said, the only money I've kept is what I give away. I know this is some difficult stuff to express, uh, but that's good about being a guest speaker. You don't have to have them back for the next 15 years. Because <laughs> giving is the index of the heart. There are a lot of CF churches in Manila, GCF, CCF, VCF. I think you can go down the whole alphabet, ACF, BCF, CCF, DC. okay. <laughs> I'm told that three uh, members were uh, having lunch together of different churches, and they're discussing how they give money to God, and the this, this CCF guy said, you know, when I get paid, I bring my money home. I draw a line and I throw my money up. Whatever falls on that side, God takes. Whatever falls on this side, I take. And I can stand as close to the line as necessary. The VCF guy said, no, that's not how I give money to God. When I get paid, I bring my money home. I draw a circle and throw my money up. Whatever falls on the inside, God takes. Whatever falls on the outside, I take. And I can vary the size of the circle as necessary. And... Uh, one of you, I guess, GCF, uh, well-informed, theologically trained, and biblically literate said, uh, you know, when I get paid, I bring my money home, and, and I throw my money up. Whatever God wants, he keeps. Whatever comes down, I keep. Um, instead, the advantage of personal spirituality a relationship spirituality. Not letting your left hand knowing what your right hand is doing has divine recognition. It says verse 4, so that your giving will be in secret and your father is seeing right now. Samuel says, God looks on the heart. <laughs> At best we can look on the outward appearance. He's the one who can uh, see exactly what you're doing in all your good works. Here is the benefit. The benefit is effective rather than defective. It is not present human recognition which dissipates. The last part of verse 4 says, The Father, your Father, who sees you, He sees what is done will repay you, will reward you in full. Here's the benefit. It is the Father's reward. Not a contractual wage, but a reward for your clean motives. He looks at your heart and he says, this guy really wanted to please me. And out of my relationship, with him, he concealed his giving. 
and he gave generously. He didn't practice his righteousness to be noticed and honored by men. I can see that he was doing it for my sake, so that people will glorify me and his relationship to me. If you look at the end of verse 1, it says, You have no reward with your father. If you're doing it for public relations. But this word with is a beautiful word. That God in heaven has his reward with him for you. He's got it reserved just for you. And when you increasingly give out of pure motives, guess what? He will repay you in full. In the Old Testament, the rewards are all earthly and material. And that's how we are trained to think. Now, in God's economy, it's both Old Testament and New Testament, both earth and heaven, both present and future, both immediate and long term. Uh, the benefit is you will have divine He will not be a debtor to you here or forever. A friend of mine gave us office spaces for 11 years. Free, free rent, free utilities, free janitor. He got a chance to sell it and he was extremely burdened that he had to sell it. But for 11 years, one of the great gifts we received. But every time I would say, thank you, this was his standard response. This is the only thing eternal happening in our building. This is the only thing eternal happening in the building. Only thing eternal happening in the building. He will have his reward and full of joy right now and an anticipation toward the future. Personal relationship spirituality comes from inside out, an overflow. This is what it looks. Giving for divine recognition and the Father's joyful reward. But public relations spirituality is giving for human recognition and their fleeting reward. So you get to choose. Here's a critical application. The first word of verse 1 says beware. Be aware. Take care because before you know it, it'll be gone. If you don't take care as to how you give. Beware. Uh, first of all, I want you to be sure who your father is, okay? I'm not talking about your biological father. I'm talking about your spiritual father. If you do not know the Lord Jesus as your father, please speak to us. Speak to one of the pastors. You need to secure that. Nothing else will make sense. You'll be only performing for others if you don't know the Lord Jesus as your father because you want to have power or cleansing. You want to have the energy, the freedom, or the direction in order to please the father. To live as God intended. But to most of you, here is a critical application. The word beware. I ask you to examine your motives. Let me give you a couple of steps. First, identify your motives. Identify your motives. Ooh. It's a simple answer to a seven-word question. Why do I do what I do? Go ahead, write that down, and ask this question about everything. Why do I do what I do. Why do I give? Why do I come to church? Why do I go to small group? Identify your motives. Secondly, I want you to clarify your motives. Clarify. Not only identify, but clarify. Here it is. We will not have absolutely pure motives till we get to heaven, but you can have substantially pure motives. Actually, in the matters of giving, praying, and fasting, you'll know what your motives are very easily. We have both social and business psychology, which tells us that intrinsic motivation and extrinsic rewards have a connection. 
But the greater the intrinsic motivation, the less relevant the extrinsic reward. That's why I like people who work around me and I want to work around people who have great intrinsic motivation regardless of what the reward is. So when you clarify your motive, just put a two-column chart. Good motives, bad motives. Pleasing God for God's sake, pleasing God to control Him. Giving to God for goodness sake, giving to God for public relations sake. Identify your motives, clarify your motives. Third, sanctify your motives. Purify your motives. As you look at them saying, God, these are motives that I'm learning to purify. Cleanse my heart, O oh God. I confess my wrong motives to you. Because you can cleanse me through the forgiveness of my sin. By the way, God knows what your motives are. He doesn't have to be impressed. You can't get him to think better thoughts about you. Just confess him. Public relation spirituality attempts human recognition and immediate reward. That's the purpose of their spirituality. But personal relationship spirituality has the result, not purpose, has the result of divine recognition and eternal reward. Little Emma worked very hard to save what she could and buy uh, plastic, fake necklace at the mall. And she clutched on to it. It was her pride and joy. She earned it and she got it. Every night, her dad, when he put her to sleep, said, Emma, would you give me your necklace and she would say, no daddy I earned it and I bought it and it's precious to me every night dad will say to Emma would you give me that necklace and she said no not I earned it I bought it and I got it and it's precious to me But after about a week of asking her for her necklace, Emma gave it to her dad. Okay, you can have it, dad. And daddy took this sick necklace with his left hand and pulled out a beautiful velvet pouch with his right hand. It's a genuine South Pacific pearl necklace which uh, was incomparably more expensive which she could not yet begin to appreciate but far more beautiful than what she was clutching on to. Your Heavenly Father says, I'm glad you earned it, and you bought it, and you're clutching it. But give it to me. Because in my pocket is incomparable reward. Beautiful and will last forever. Public relations spirituality has the purpose of human recognition and fleeting reward. Personal relationship spirituality has divine recognition 
and as its result, divine reward. Would you bow in prayer with me? For the first group which does not know if God is their father, today is the day for you to secure it. Just quietly in the cathedral of your soul, just speak to God and say, uh, I've tried to relate to you as servant to master. I try to calculate what you owe me. But God, I want to relate to you as son and daughter to a father. for unconditional acceptance and unlimited motivation. And for the rest, whom God might have touched in some angle of your life because of uh, the message this morning, and as he continues to do that through the uh, Sermon on the Mount, uh, today is a good day to take inventory of your motives and if you confess your sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins you your sins and to cleanse and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and for the sake of a world that needs lots of good works I pray that whatever we do, Lord Jesus, for our world, for our city, for our country, for our church, and for the Great Commission, will overflow from a deep personal relationship, overwhelmed with thanksgiving for what you've done for us. To the glory of the Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I ask these things. Amen.